the fights in the riparian zone. I'm just going to show this taking a bunch of data that we've collected from one well which is representative of the wells at the site. This is an area where we're doing repeated cuttings of the salt cedar. So in 2006 we're getting regrowth of the salt cedar on the site. And what I've got here is on the bottom, I've got date during the growing season. On the left Y, I have depth below land surface. The blue line is water table position, references the left Y axis. These bars down here are daily precipitation, reference the right, lower right Y. You've got these dashed lines here, indicate zones of similar textural characteristics. Uh, the bottom dashed line is simply the depth at which uh, uh, we could no longer obtain samples. That's not an indication necessarily of a change in textural characteristics. Uh, this X indicates a three-day period when we lost uh, water level data because of uh, premature battery fil failure. The black lines are volumetric water content profiles. They reference the, the upper uh, X axis there. Uh, the intersection of those lines with the lower X is the date at which they were collected. Just want to point out two features of this plot. Notice this blue line. You can clearly see these diurnal fluctuations. Water table is falling through time here. Again, this is one of the hottest and driest uh, summers on record. Let's look at a period here in late June of 2006. What do we see? Depth to water here below land surface. There's five days here on the X. Notice these fluctuations as they're falling as they pass by this previous water table low. Now this is just based on two years of data, so we shouldn't uh, treat uh, 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 treat it too seriously, but given that this is one of the hottest and driest summers on record, it certainly is suggestive of the same behavior we observed at Larned that the water table is dropping below the bottom of the root zones. Now the question is, as how did the plants at the Ashland site respond to this water table falling below the root zone? And let's look at that. Water table falls below the root zone, it comes up with a brief precipitation, and then it drops below again uh, for the remainder of the summer. Notice that these volumetric water content profiles, pretty stable here until you drop past, the water table drops past, past the root zone. Then notice how we get this diminishment of volumetric water content there in the Vado zone above the water table. It's, as, it's suggestive as if the plants, the water table drops below the bottom of the roots, so they've got to go someplace else to get their water. In this case, because of the geologic setting, I've got the finer materials with water retention cap capability. You've got water in the Vado zone. The plants can tap into that for the water supply, and notice that later in the, uh, near the end of the growing season, we begin to see a, a diurnal pattern begin to develop in the water table position. Uh, suggestive that the plants, they lost contact with the water table here, got water from the Vado zone, and then were able to send their roots down to catch up uh, with the water table. Now, Again, that's suggestive. Isotopic work uh, did not allow us to, to draw any conclusion because there wasn't a difference in isotopic signatures between the Vados and groundwaters at this site. But this is just an illustration how hydrogeology really matters. At the Larned site, the plants didn't have the, the uh, Vado zone water that they could get to here at the Ashland. They could. Now, it also may depend on the, uh, the salt cedar and the plants at the Ashland site may be more adaptable to, uh, to these uh, sorts of stresses than the native, veg native phreatophytes. It's unclear based on what we have to date. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, some additional data I thought would be of interest to this group. So in conclusion, what I've tried to do here is demonstrate that these diurnal water table fluctuations are a diagnostic indicator of groundwater consumption by plants. I wanted to show how we could use these fluctuations to get insights. For example, at the Larned Research Zone, a research site 
into the factors leading to the demise of the riparian zone at that site, and also insights, more fundamental insights, into controls on plant water use and the importance of previous hydrologic conditions experienced by the riparian zone vegetation. And at the Ashland Research Site, we could use these diurnal fluctuations to evaluate the water savings from the control activities. And what we realize is that these large invasive phreatophytes are not the sole players here, that the ultimate water savings may be much less than anticipated in terms of these large-scale efforts to get rid of the invasive phreatophytes. But bottom line here is hydrogeology really does matter. And that's some comfort to me as a groundwater hydrologist. So in any way, let me bring this conclusion just with some acknowledgement, funding sources, work done in cooperation with a large number of individuals. Uh, two or three I want to indicate, specifically Gerard Klutenberg, a soil physicist of great renown at Kansas State uh, University, my colleague Don Whittemore at the Kansas Geological Survey, and plant physiologist Jesse Nippert, now at Kansas State University, and Joy Ward at the University of Kansas and the Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture Series in Groundwater Science, sponsored by the Na National Groundwater Research and Educational Foundation. I apologize for going on uh, way too long here, uh, but I appreciate your understanding. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you.